Hey, I want to give a big JHP thank you to all the folks out there who wrote in with praise and kudos and to say how much they enjoyed my return episode last week. Always a treat to hear from you people, and it warms my cockles to know that you appreciate what I'm doing. But you know, you can't please everybody, and there is an element of the listening population who is a little bit disappointed that I shortened the intro, okay? The prevailing thought out there seems to be that the OG, that's a very hip thing to say, the OG intro is the way to go. And in the words of Mayor Quimby, if that is the way the winds are blowing, let no one say I don't also blow. So before we get to what is kind of a hodgepodge today, kids, I present the OG intro in its entirety. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, you know what? That is a good intro. Why don't we hear it again? You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Ooh, third time's a charm, right? Hit it, boys! Oh, stop it. I heard a great song last week. Happens sometimes, man. You're just out there in the world, or in my case, inside in the world. And you're flipping through the tracks and you run across something you have not heard before that just hits you where you live, man. And in this case, it was a tune by an artist called Samantha Fish. Do you know Samantha Fish? Samantha Fish is uh, loosely described or most typically described as a blues artist, okay? She is American, and she is a wicked blues guitar player, man. And she released a song, she's released a bunch of stuff this year, but she released a single called Twisted Ambition, okay? And it's just a great song. It's just a great song. Now, I encountered Samantha Fish via our old friend Sarah Tomek, okay? I'm scrolling through the Instagram. Now, you know I'm not spending as much time on social media these days, but I am on the gram a little bit, because you still got to promote the show, man. So I'm on the gram, and that's become my preferred social media destination of choice. And I follow our old friend Sarah Tomek. Sarah Tomek, drummer extraordinaire, Nashville session and touring star, the drummer in Steven Tyler's solo band, and the 11th guest on this program. Sarah Tomek is great. I met her at a Steven Tyler concert in Toronto. You know, if you're one of the relatively new listeners to the show and you haven't gone back through the archives, I'm still reluctant to point people to the archives, okay? Because the archives don't feel so good to me. The interviews are good, all right? The people I had on the show for the first however many episodes it was, we were an interview-based podcast in those days. And the interviews are good. You know, I'm an experienced interviewer. The people I brought on had great stories to tell. They were very personable, very interesting, okay? But what was around the interviews, not so good. Makes me just a little embarrassed, and I do not like to go back to listen to it. My intros, particularly in the first 12 or 13, were only like four sentences long, but I had not yet discovered my vocal idiom, all right? I'm a writer. I come from a writing background, so I didn't have to present my voice. (laughs) And it took me a long time to develop 
whatever idiom this is that's speaking to you right now. So you go back to those early episodes, and it's just not good, man. Nicht gut. But everything is in evolution, and I've talked about this before. And for the moment, (laughs) I leave the episodes up because, A, the content is really good once you get past the host. (laughs) And, you know, the medium is the message. Things get better. Things evolve. Things improve over time. Good things happen when you put yourself out there. So if you can stand me (laughs) and those intros, the four-sentence intros back in the day, there's some good stuff to be listened to back there, and my, my interview with Sarah Tomek is one of them, all right? Sarah Tomek is a great story, and the story she tells about getting the Steven Tyler gig is just, you know, the convergence of hard work and timing and synchronicity and all of that stuff. And I met her through the similar process of timing and synchronicity. Right? So this was maybe 20, I don't know, 17, something like that. And I'm not going to give you the whole dang story all over again, but Steven Tyler's on tour with his solo record. Sarah Tomek is in his band. I have just seen her in Modern Drummer Magazine, featured. I didn't know her before that. And so I read this great feature on Sarah Tomek. She's awesome. Nashville, the whole thing. And then it turns out she's touring with Steven Tyler. Steven Tyler's coming to Toronto. And... Jen Marino of now Jen Marino and the Hearts, formerly Hiroshima Hearts, the band I was in, has a connection somehow to the gig, right? She has a connection to somebody who has a connection to the woman who runs the Steven Tyler VIP meet and greets. And so word comes down that they're going to need some folks to work the meet and greet. Opportunity knocks for two folks who want to be around and work the show. Long story short, it becomes Jen and I who go down to Toronto to work the gig. And we, so we do the VIP, we're wristbanding people, and then Jen's in the room with Steven Tyler while he's meeting and greeting. I'm in the room, I'm in the collapse room. <laughs> I'm in the collapse room where you come after you've met Steven Tyler. And you've fulfilled this 40-year-old ambition to throw yourself at Steven Tyler's snakeskin booted feet. (laughs) And then you get done that, and they sort of carry you over to the collapse room where I am, and I give you a drink. You know, I take your drink ticket, I set you up, and you can faint, you know, and I'm there to kind of fan you. (laughs) So you get all these, you know, middle-aged women coming in, just sweating. Sweating and breathing and sighing that they finally met the man himself. And that's all very good. So at the end of all of this, this is like a day-long process, the woman who runs the thing, you know, comes up to us and says, you guys planning to stay for the show? We're like, yeah? Oh, terrific. Here's your backstage pass. Whoa. So we're backstage at the Steven Tyler gig, And I'm on the stage. I'm quite literally side stage, standing behind the white line. Steven Tyler's coming around, you know, singing in everybody's face, going along like I'm two feet from the dude. And I'm six feet behind Sarah Tomek watching her play this gig. And what an education that is, man. What a great player. What an ebullient and exuberant and technically gifted and powerful player Sarah Tomek is. And so after the show, we're milling about backstage, Steven Tyler's being mobbed, even backstage where he's supposed to be protected, you know, all the hangers on and people who somehow wind up backstage at shows. They're all crowded around Steven Tyler, and I'm kind of standing a few feet from him, but you can't see him because there's a mob, right? One of my favorite moments of this whole experience is when the VIP's over and we're milling about backstage, and I walk past a dressing room, and there hanging on a hanger is a pair of the skinniest little pants you ever saw. (laughs) And I'm like, that's Steven Tyler's pants. And I should have taken them. But you know, professional integrity and all that stuff. VIP, man. No take the pants. (laughs) Anyways, so Steven Tyler's being mobbed backstage. Incredibly gracious. Extraordinarily gracious man. Legit star, right? Steven Tyler. 
I make a beeline for Sarah Tomek. I'm like, dude, you were the show. <laughs> I don't think I called her dude, but Sarah Tomek, you were the show for me. And she was, and she's awesome. And we got to chat for a few minutes, and that's great. So you fast forward a couple of years, I'm running the JHP, doing interviews, because that's how this thing started. And I sends a message via Instagram to Sarah Tomek. And she, I think she pretended to remember me, though I'm sure she didn't. <laughs> We wind up doing an interview. It is episode number 11. It's great. And so I still follow Sarah, of course, on the Instagram because she's a legit working pro. And the legit working pros are the people I like to follow because I like to learn how they're conducting themselves, what they're doing, what it takes, what sort of mindset, what sort of behaviors, you know, it takes to be a working pro at that level. Quite apart from the skill that's required, you know. How do these people conduct themselves and how do they operate? And so I follow Sarah and I follow Chris Powell and I follow Jason Tate and I follow all these cats, right? And so a few weeks ago, I think this is how it worked. I'm scrolling Instagram and uh, something pops up on Sarah Tomek's feed and she's playing in a video or something and it's this artist, Samantha Fish. Now, when she's not playing with Steven Tyler, Sarah Tomek primarily plays with Maggie Rose. Maggie Rose, who's like a country rock thing, I think based in Nashville, and she's really great too. The Samantha Fish thing just looked cool, all right? Samantha Fish has got this thing happening. (laughs) Somebody described her as looking like a 50s housewife who don't want to be a housewife anymore, but I think that gives slightly the wrong impression. It's a 50s housewife if she was the hippest 50s housewife of all time. Looks a little bit like Madonna these days. How Madonna used to look. (laughs) This is not a program about fashion or what artists look like. But Samantha Fish is super put together, okay? She's got this great look going. And so I'm looking at this like, oh, cool. Sarah's playing with this person. I'll have to check that out. And so I went digging around, checking out the Samantha Fish. And wow, you know, I listened to a bunch of stuff. It was cool. She's got a bunch of records out, like, I don't know, four or five studio records, like full lengths. And she's been dropping singles this year. And so I'm listening to this stuff. I'm like, this is cool. And this girl rips, man. Great voice. Really great ripping blues guitar player. And I liked all this stuff and it's cool. And then something, you know, I got through a record. And then it popped up, this new song started playing, and it just grabbed me by the face. Don't you love it when a tune just grabs you by the face? Man. So I'm listening to this tune, and it's Twisted Ambition, all right? And it's just a great bluesy rock song. And you know how much I love me some bluesy rock songs, man. And so it just pulled me right off the bat. It's got like this Colin James kind of thing. You Canadian people who remember kind of 80s, 90s, Colin James with that tone. I am so learning to appreciate guitar tones, man. I am by no means a guitar player, but I've always been kind of hip or at least kind of sensitive to how guitars sound on recordings, right? And you listen to like an 80s Anthrax record or an Accept record, like I've always been hip to particularly rock metal guitar tones. And I get annoyed when the guitar tone's not heavy enough, or it's not right, or it's not clear enough, or the distortion just doesn't work for me. But when I hear a nice guitar tone, I really hear it, and I really appreciate it, and I get what tone does. I get how tone changes the way a song sounds. And, you know, I'm again, I'm no guitar player, but I watch how the pedals go and how you can click something and all of a sudden you've got like an edge tone and this atmosphere coming into a tune and what that adds to it. And, you know, I'm just listening to the intro to this Samantha Fish song, Twisted Ambition, and it's, it's got like a ZZ Top thing. I mean, this is blues rock, all right? And she has like a lot of sounds. She came up as, I think, like a mostly a straight up blues kind of player, like cigar box guitars, this kind of stuff, like old school throwback blues, man. She has evolved since. Again, it's all an evolution, man. 
And so she's got a bit of soul happening. She's got a bit of country happening. She's got a bit of kind of pop happening, kind of a Jill Barber thing here and there, which is kind of retro 40s almost. It's a lot going on in Samantha Fish's music. And I'm listening to this tune and I'm digging it because the pocket is deep and the groove is all right. Makes you feel good, man. Warms your cockles. But then it happens. You can feel it building into this chorus. And then she hits the chorus, Twisted Ambition. And it just grabs you right there because there's a chord. She comes in on this twist. It just hits this chord, right? And it's heavy, man. It's a country sounding chorus, like a new country sounding chorus. But underneath it is just this roar of a guitar chord. And I don't know how many parts of vocal harmony. (laughs) And it's a wall of sound, man. It's a wall that hits you. It's just this slab of sound. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely freaking beautiful. And it's so heavy. And she's playing licks through it, you know. And there's a second verse and a second chorus. And then there's a stop. And then just this guitar solo. It's a very short guitar solo, only a few bars, but again, it's tone, and it's such a hot lick, man. This girl is a badass. (laughs) Don't you love a badass, like a musical rock and roll badass? Samantha Fish is that, and this tune, Twisted Ambition, just grabbed me. And just listening to that girl play guitar, and listening to her sing... And the whole combination of things, it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah. One of the reasons, you know, I was inspired to bring this show back after my short hiatus was this process of discovering new music. And that's Samantha Fish, man. That is part of the lineage. And I owe that to Sarah Tomek. It's interesting how it all weaves together. But if you're looking for something that's just really great, And if you want a chorus you could dig into and that's heavy and rocks and there's guitar tones happening and this girl is so freaking cool, go and listen to Samantha Fish and her tune, Twisted Ambition. I think she's got a new record coming out this year. She's been faithfully releasing at least one every two years since like 2011 or something. 2017, she released two albums. (laughs) She's prolific, and it's working for her because she's got freaking Sarah Tomek playing in her band, all right? And you know you've reached a level when somebody like Sarah is jumping in and playing with you. Samantha Fish is very cool, and if you have not listened to her music, you should do so. All you guitar slingers out there, all you people who dig the blue stuff, go back and check out the older stuff. People who like variety, people who like something new, check out the newer stuff. And if you do nothing else, listen to Twisted Ambition, okay? And I will put that where? On the John Huff Podcast reference on the podcast playlist. You can count on seeing it there, you know? And it ties in, because last week we talked about Elvis. The real Elvis, the Delta Blues Elvis. I don't know if I'm allowed to say Delta. (laughs) I might get flagged for coronavirus misinformation because the Delta variant is ripping up the world right now. Uh, So if I can't say Delta, I apologize for that. But Delta Blues, Elvis, we talked about that last week. It flows in. Now you got Samantha Fish and this kind of more modern blues sound. It's all part of a lineage. It got me thinking about blues, man, and something we have not talked about much on the show. It's been mentioned in passing. But that's the Grinder Blues project that Doug Pinnock put out, I think, in 2014. I want to say 2014. Doug Pinnock, of course, the, uh, the face and the voice mostly of King's X. If you've been listening for any length of time, I don't need to say anything more about King's X and where King's X stands in my musical hierarchy. That's at the top, kids. But six or seven years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, Doug just went through this whole period, this just explosion of output. And at that time, I interviewed him for the London Groove Machine, and I think I counted seven side projects that were all releasing music at the same time. (laughs) There was Third Ear Experience, and there was Tress Mountains. Tress Mountains is a really great record that he did with Jeff Ament of Pearl Jam. And uh, you should go check that out, the Tress Mountains record. Very, very eclectic, very cool. Some really great stuff on it. 
and they did um like the Fallon show like they they really pushed that and they toured a bit on it and they got some TV and very very cool so that was happening I don't know a Pinnock Gales Pridgen might might have been happening at that point there was a bunch of stuff going but Grinder Blues was kind of the flagship so what he did was Doug got together with the Billman brothers okay J Bo and Scotty Little Billman and they are I think they were like Vegas guys who write primarily for film and TV, but they had the Billman Brothers Band, and they play bluesy stuff. Really terrific players, both of them. Uh, Little plays the drums, and j plays the guitar, all right. And so they got together, and they decided to put out this blues record that they called Grinder Blues, all right? But what this was, was heavy blues. And I dig me some heavy blues, man. So the Grinder Blues record was drop-tuned, like seriously drop-tuned. Again, by no means a guitar player, and for some of you this won't mean anything, but I think the whole record was recorded in drop C, all right? That's down there, kids. That's about, you know, you hit the bass, <laughs> the string on the drop C, and it wobbles there for like a minute and a half. You know what I mean? But it was perfect. Now, Doug has always had the soul, man. Doug has always had what makes King's X a little bit different for a lot of people is this kind of level of soul that Doug has in the voice, right? Comes from a gospel background, sang in church, kind of Southern Baptist kind of thing. Doug's always had that, but as he's gotten older, his voice has gotten lower. And so, again, a convergence, right? Perfect timing. Doug's voice is getting a little lower, getting a little gravelly. Let's do a stripped-down, drop-tuned blues record. And so you get this Grinder Blues album, which was released on Megaforce, I think. Pretty cool, right? Or maybe it was actually on Atlantic. Anyways, it was released on a substantial record label, and they did videos and they toured on it and stuff, but it's a really great album. Very simple, very stripped-down, right? But heavy. Drop C, man seriously heavy blues record. And Grinder Blues is a great name for it, right? So this is kind of the modern blues that people like me are listening to, you know? And so we flash forward from there to like 2017. Again, I think it was 2017. That was a big year, man. That was the first time I toured Europe <laughs> and all this stuff's happening. We find out that the Grinder Blues are going to be playing in Traverse City, Michigan, okay? Because I reckon the Billman brothers come from Traverse City, all right? So our old pal Jay and I were like, how many chances are you going to get to see Grinder Blues? They did not tour a lot. They don't play a lot. You know, they did one record, although I think there's another one coming and in the not-too-distant future, so hold on to your hats for that. So Jay and I drives over to Traverse City, Michigan, and we find out that Grinder Blues is playing one night, and as it turns out, the night before, Jackal is playing. Oh yeah, man, get your chainsaws ready, man. Jackal's coming to Traverse City. There's this great club over there, big, big club, holds I don't know how many thousand, and Jackal's gonna play it, so we're like, well, I guess we're gonna have to go a day early, because how many chances are you gonna get to see Jackal, man? And Jackal... Jackal's one of the bands that got lost in the shuffle just a little bit. Came on just like Love Hate. Came on just at the end of the hair metal era. Jackal, not really a hair metal band, but lumped in because they had long hair and they played more of an ACDC sound, right? But again, that's blues. That's kind of modern blues. So you listen to that first Jackal record, and that's a great record. I mean, if you have not listened to the first Jackal record, Yada. <laughs> All right. That's a platinum selling record. Played some big rooms. They got like one or two years of being a big band before the whole scene collapsed. But Jackal didn't collapse. Jackal kept right on going, man. Releasing records. They continue to release records and they had just dropped a new one when we went to see him. Now, I said before on the show, if you're going to see a band you liked 30 years later, especially a rock and roll band or a hair metal band, 
so I'm going to get in trouble for saying hair metal, a glam metal band that was so much driven by vocal acrobatics. Yeah, chronic, you know, you hold your breath just a little bit when the band comes out on stage and you're like, okay, guy's going to sing. Does he still sound like the guy? Are we going to get, you know, a reasonable hand-drawn facsimile of how this band used to sound? So we're in the audience, the place is packed out, and out comes Jackal. And we see Jesse James Dupree, the legend man, Jesse James, comes out and he opens his mouth and... It's Jesse James, man. He sounded like Jesse James and crushed it. Crushed it! Jackal was great, man. The band had tons of energy. They looked cool. Sounded awesome. Jesse sounded like Jesse. Dude, I've seen some of these cats play, and they did not sound like themselves. Or they had everything, you know, they dropped the tuning on everything so that the singer can still kind of pretend to hit the high notes. This is not a judgment, man. We get older. <laughs> a lot of these guys abuse their voices pretty badly, and their bodies, and it shows. Poor freaking Vince Neil is just getting smoked out there right now. It's got to be tough. I don't know if Vince Neil reads his own press or not. Maybe he doesn't. I would advise against it were I his publicist. Because Vince is just getting roasted these days because he's doing solo shows and he's kind of bailing on them and the voice is not really there and people will tell you that the voice was never there <laughs> or at least for the last 15 years has most certainly not been there. And poor Vince is getting dragged around and they're supposed to do this Motley Crue stadium tour with Def Leppard and Joan Jett and whoever, Poison, I think. And people are like, I don't know if Vince has got it, man. And the evidence suggests there may be a problem there. And so this is what you run into. You get older, maybe you don't look after yourself. And by the time you get there, man, the voice can be shot. Jesse James Dupree's voice is not shot. It was pristine. And I don't know if that's lifestyle. The dude promotes Jesse James bourbon. So <laughs> I don't know, man, if he's given up the drinking or not. Didn't look like it on stage, but there could have been anything in those bottles. I don't know. And maybe it's just not having sung all that much, you know, for the past 25 years. I mean, Jackal tours around and they play quite a bit, but not the kind of grinding 200 date schedule, you know, that they probably had during that brief period at the top. That will wreak havoc on your voice, especially if you don't have technique. I only know that from listening to and observing singers. That's not from firsthand knowledge. Anyways, Jackal destroyed. It was freaking great. You know, the last show, they come out with a chainsaw, the lumberjack song. Jesse James cuts up a stool. He cuts, he carves the name of the band in the ceiling. <laughs> there are tiles up there. And he climbs up on a ladder and he, I mean, he did a pro job. It's obvious that he's done this jackal with the chainsaw like thousands of times. It was great. The show was freaking awesome. And afterwards, we stood in line and we shook hands with Jesse and the rest of the band. And I think there was a marriage proposal. <laughs> I think somebody stopped in front of the band and got down on one knee or something like that. It was weird, man. It was very weird. But it was a cool show. And if you have not listened to the first Jackal record, actually listen to all the Jackal records. But you'll find the hits on the first one. Down on me. When will it rain? And I, I can remember. And the Lumberjack song. And I can remember... I stand alone. I can remember being in my first year of university and the war had begun. Z-Rock Radio over there across the pond. I did my first year at Windsor and let's never speak of it again. But we'd get Z-Rock out of Detroit and it would be like Pearl Jam. And we're like, what is this? And then they'd play Firehouse. And then they'd play whatever, probably Nirvana. And we're like, eh. And then... They'd play Jackal. Jackal was very big, man. 92, 93, when that first record was out going platinum, Jackal was a thing, and then the whole scene got washed away. But they carried on, and they did a freaking great show, 2017. All right, the next night was the main course, okay? We got to see the Grinder Blues. And, you know, when I was listening to the Samantha Fish song, and that first chorus kicks in, in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is the opening song of your set. <laughs> and when that chord hits on the first chorus, that just big roaring 
guitar chord and all the harmonies and it's loud and if the sound is dialed in that knocks you on your butt man you hear that and you go we're in territory here the grinder blues was like that they just come out the billman brothers band played for a while and they were great and then they brought out doug and i don't even know if a lot of the people in that audience realized who had come out on stage I don't think they realized that a kind of underground icon, an icon among musicians, you know, of the last 30 years was in their presence with his left-handed bass guitar on, you know? I don't think they realized freaking Doug Pinnock, who he is and what he's done, was standing in front of them. But then Grinder Blues, you know, began to play. And, whoo, so heavy, man. And it was loud, and the sound was great, and it was just grooving. That Grinders Blues record just grooves, man. It is old school blues, drop tuned and heavy, and I love that. Did you ever listen to the Grady records when Gordy Johnson kind of split from Big Sugar, moved down to Austin, Texas, put on a cowboy hat, and started playing like this cowboy rock and roll metal stuff? Drop tuned as well. The Grady record is. The, they did two or three records, but the first one, you know, Why You So Shady, that's the first Grady record. And man, just heavy, simple blues, man. Grinder Blues, very much the same idea. And then they just slammed us in the head for an hour. <laughs> they just pounded for an hour, man. And it was great. It was so great. Man, that kind of simple, grooving music played heavy. Tough to beat that, man. Tough to beat it. And when I got home from that, I was inspired. And so at the time, I was still in hearts. And I sat down and I'm like, I want to write a tune like that. I want to write a slow, grooving, drop tune blues song. And I did. I wrote this little tune called If You Love Me Still. And I would have put it in drop C, but not being a guitar player, I don't know how to tune to drop C. <laughs> So I tuned to drop D, man. That's where I sit. That's my range. And I wrote this tune called If You Love Me Still. And it was just like that. You know, baby left me, that kind of stuff. The blues motifs. Baby said, let me go. If you love me still, let me go. I forget what the lyrics were. And then I took it to the band, and the band made it good. <laughs> I brought in the shell. I brought in a finished song. And this is how it works, man. You take it into the band. And the band makes it good. And they did. And we played that tune a couple times before I wound up leaving the band. And I don't know if they still use it or not. Probably they don't since it was kind of my song. Maybe I need to take that song and do something with it. Maybe, just thinking about it right now, maybe I should try doing more of those tunes. Do my own little heavy blues rock record, you know? Thinking about that at this moment. There was a fun moment at the Grinder Blues gig, right? where I'm standing up front. You got to get up front, man. So I'm standing up front, pretty much in front of Doug, and I'm wearing my King's X Gretchen Ghost to Nebraska t-shirt. Because what else you going to wear, man? And at a certain point, Doug looks down, and he sees my shirt, and he smiles, and he says, I like your shirt. Oh, I like your shirt, man. Thought you would, Doug. And that made me laugh, because I've had that moment not quite like that, but I've had a, a t-shirt moment. <laughs> t-shirt moments are funny when you're in a band. Merch moments are funny. One time, I go to see somebody play at a club, you know, in L-Town. And I walk past the pool table, and there's a dude getting ready to take a shot wearing a Hiroshima Hearts t-shirt. <laughs> One of the original shirts with the big heart on it. Some of you guys out there and ladies, you own that shirt, and we do thank you for your purchase. So I just sort of patted the guy on the shoulder and said, great shirt, man, and just kept walking. And he's like, oh, thanks. And he turns around to hit the shot. And it was just a funny moment because, hey, I'm in that band that I see somebody wearing my shirt, and that's cool. I got a good friend called Colin. Colin was in a band called In Faith back in Toronto, back in the early 90s. If you're around the Toronto underground scene in the early 90s, you may have run across In Faith, which was kind of an alt-rock, goth kind of vibe. Great band, and I do have a copy of their EP. 
Tougher to make an EP in those days, kids. Like, you needed, like, a studio and a producer and a lot of money. You can do it more simply now. Anyways, you know, In Faith was kind of a thing around Toronto back in the day. And I really liked their record. And so he's walking down the street one time, and a dude walks toward him wearing an In Faith t-shirt. Very cool. And I don't remember all of the specifics of this story, but the dude's just glaring at Colin, this dude passing by him, you know? Like, not recognizing that's the band, that you're wearing that dude's shirt. <laughs> no, just some dude that he's glaring at passing by on the street, you know? It's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. Sometimes the merch is more recognizable than the band, you know? <laughs> Especially if you're the drummer, and every time somebody takes a picture at your show, you're behind the singer. <laughs> Nobody ever sees the dang drummer, man. That's the way it goes sometimes. You want the coolest position, sometimes you gotta sacrifice being seen, you know what I mean? Funny t-shirt stories. And so I got to talk to Doug after that, remind him not for the first time that he had been interviewed on my music blog and he did not remember. But, you know, it was a proud moment for me when I did that interview with him. Grinder Blues had not come out yet. And Doug Pinnock himself sent me that record via email before it had even been released. And that warms your cockles, man. That is a nice moment when the singer, the talisman, the frontman of your favorite band sends you his new record personally before it's even been released. Life of a music blogger, man. As, as I was watching them get ready to start the show, right, they kind of took the blanket off of Scotty Little Billman's drum set. Little is an ironic nickname, okay, because he's a really big dude. <laughs> like, towers over me. And I'm like 6'8". And so I'm looking at the drums, and they're shiny. Like, shiny, and there's like an, uh, an orange-purple tinge going through them, depending on how the lights hit them. And they're all dimpled like a golf ball. And I'm like, are those drums metal? For those of you who are not drummers, drums are typically wood and occasionally acrylic, okay? But these are shiny. Shiny drums. I'm like, whoa, that's weird, man. And then as the show goes on, I'm like, those drums are metal. Not metal sounding. Like, they're physically metal. So after the show, I'm talking to Scotty Little Billman. Great show, Scotty. Hey, thanks, man. And I'm like, dude, were those drums metal? He's like, yeah, they're copper. Copper drums, man. Now, we know about metal snare drums. We know about copper snare drums. That's not an unusual thing at all. But I had, to that point in my life, never seen metal toms and metal bass drum. I'm like, how heavy are those things? They must be heavy, man. They're metal. Heavy metal. So Scotty Little Billman's playing metal, copper, freaking drums. And the light's shining off them, and they sound amazing. They sound huge. Playing drop C tuned blues rock and roll with Doug Pinnock. That's pretty freaking cool, man. And I had a fun t-shirt incident with the grinder blues, you know? And ain't it funny? Ain't it funny? Wow, I've already taken way more time than I thought I was going to with that. And it's just not new, you know? It's not new for me to sit down before the episode and be like, I don't know if I got enough material. And then I got way too much material. Life of a podcaster, kids. So again, we're streamlining things. So I'm going to wrap soon. You know, I hope uh, this episode length is okay by all you cats out there. But I did get some great feedback on the last episode. I do sincerely appreciate that. And we got to clear up a couple of things, though, okay? Because I mentioned the Walk with Yan television cooking program. <laughs> that it was a staple of daytime TV when we were kids, all right? Back when your mom and I were still together. Walk with Yan, Stephen Yan, cooking Chinese dishes for a studio audience. And it warms your cockles to think about it now, because it was fun and silly and punny, and Stephen Yan was such a charismatic and fun host. He used to play with the food and play with his implements, you know, and all the bad dad jokes and the puns. But my old pal, the maestro, Aaron, wrote to say, hey, I loved Walk with Yan, loved that guy, but I wonder if you've got the title wrong. Wasn't the show called Yan Can Cook? 
And you get half a point, all right? You get half a point, maestro, because there was a program called Yan Can Cook, but it was a different Yan, okay? Stephen Yan was Walk With Yan. Martin Yan was Yan Can Cook. Very confusing. And what are the odds, you know? What are the odds that at roughly the same time we got these two Yan cooking shows? <laughs> but Stephen Yan's show was produced in Canada, Walk With Yan. And I'm pretty sure Martin Yan's show was produced in the States, all right? Interesting side note, Martin Yan used to work for Stephen Yan, apparently, back in the day. Stephen Yan had like a minor restaurant empire happening in Vancouver back late 70s, early 80s, okay? And apparently Martin Yan used to work for him, so the two of them do indeed go together. But Aaron, maestro, not the same program, okay? And if you haven't actually watched the Walk with Yan show, maybe you're, you've watched Walk with Yan and you know what I'm talking about, but you thought it was called Yan Can Cook. And I can distinctly remember looking through the TV guide. Remember the TV guide, kids? Used to be a print edition of the TV listings that would come to your home every week. And you'd open it up and you'd look at the movies you want to see. <laughs> you'd look for Fast Times at Ridgemont High playing on a Saturday night, censored. And I can remember looking through the listings and seeing Yan can cook and be like, well, is that the show? Is that walk with Yan? Is that the same guy? What are the chances? You know, not the same guy, not the same show. Steven Yan's an interesting cat. Okay. Because this show pr was produced. I think, um, they did like 500 episodes of walk with Yan late seventies into the early eighties. And then it ran on syndication until the mid nineties. Okay. You can still see it on YouTube and it's great to go and look at. It's a lot of fun. But he was kind of a pioneer. You know, cooking shows were not then what they are now. I mean, now we've got whole networks dedicated to the cooking shows, man. We got Emeril Lagasse and Guy Fieri and all these cats who are like big stars. Stephen Yan was kind of a pioneer, okay? Because some of his episodes, maybe all of them, I can't remember, but some of his episodes also included like a mini travel log. So there'd be five or six minutes of Stephen Yan in Thailand or someplace showing you the sights, giving you a bit of the history. It was kind of Bourdain before Bourdain, you know, in bite-sized chunks. And so then they would come and they'd do the cooking segments. And at the end of the show, somebody would get to go up on stage and eat the food with them that he prepared. And apparently there was like a ticket lottery before the taping where somebody got to win that chance to go up and be on stage and eat the food. A lot of pressure there, man, a lot of pressure. Because what if you don't like shrimp? What if you don't like the prawns, man? <laughs> and today we're making, I don't know, Szechuan prawns or something like that. <sighs> really got to sell that. Really got to sell it. So it was a great show, and it was a pioneering kind of show. And Stephen Yan was on, like, Letterman. He was a big deal for a while. And then his show ended, or production of it ended, syndication went on, and he just kind of dropped out of public life. He did a few kind of travel specials did a bit more TV, but at a certain point just kind of disappeared from public life. And that's very interesting. Now, in my research, I was poking around. He's still alive as far as I know. He was actually on Twitter as recently as a few years ago. Walk the heck, I think, was his Twitter handle. And what else could it be, right? What else could it be? And apparently won his age group in the Boston Marathon, like the 57-58 category. And apparently he summited Mount Everest after a few tries. Like this guy went on and did some cool stuff and didn't feel the need to present a curated social media presentation of it all, man. <laughs> Got to respect him for that. And I read a quote from him on a message board somewhere from around like 06, 07. So people were like, where are you, Steve? We miss you. And basically the quote said, you know what? I'm healthy, I'm happy, my family's good, I'm living a private life, and it's all good, and thanks for your interest. Don't you love that man? Guy who played to the beat of his own drum. Played to his own shuffle, Stephen Yan still does. Was public for a while, made some really cool TV, disappeared, he's happy, he's doing his thing. Doesn't need plaudits, doesn't need attention, doesn't need to be praised. Gotta respect that about a guy, man. And he made what has turned out to be an iconic television program that those of us of a certain generation still look fondly back on today. But he is not Martin Yan, and he is not Yan Ken Cook, okay? Just want to clarify that for everybody out there who's confused. 
And then suddenly, we hit like 43 minutes, kids. How did that happen? I got good news, all right? I got good news for you. I got to shut this off either way because I got to get ready for... Hold on to your hats. Got to get ready for a rehearsal, man. Yes! Your old pal Johnny still tries to play the drums just a little bit. And Ken the Zen and I got hired to play a couple of CD release shows for a local band called Fresh Breath, who are friends of ours. Fresh Breath, who I mentioned a couple episodes back, they had dropped a new single. I forget which one, I apologize, but their EP has finally been released. Came out a couple weeks ago, you can find it, I think, on the Bandcamp. So go to, it's probably freshbreath.bandcamp.com, and you can hear the record! A little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. Really, really terrific people, really, really terrific songwriters, and we are very happy and honored and blessed to be playing a couple of shows with them, one at the end of this month and one in the first week of September at a venue called Barn on the Farm. And I got to go get ready to rehearse, man, and what a nice feeling that is. Because there's a lot of darkness in the world, kids. It's still coming at us. I dropped onto Facebook to look up something, to find some information recently. And it took about 13 seconds to witness people yelling at each other about vaccines. <laughs> it took about 13 seconds just to see the toxicity and the yelling and the lunacy and the conspiracies. And I'm like, I got to check right back out, kids. Thank you very much. So most of my action is on Instagram these days. I've said that before. Go find me, JW underscore Huff, on the Instagram. That's where you'll find a lot of the updates on the program. You can also follow the Facebook page. The John Huff Podcast page on Facebook does get updated regularly. I cross-post from Instagram usually. So if you're looking for information on my personal profile, you will not find much there anymore because I ain't spending much time on Facebook. Trying to keep up with the show. John Huff Podcast on Facebook or JW underscore Huff on Instagram, okay? There's still a lot of darkness and there's the Delta variant happening. People are getting upset about that and you don't know who to trust and you don't know who to freaking believe. But I'm here to say there's still some good stuff happening and I have a rehearsal to get to and man, does it get much better than that. So I'm going to sign off. Again, you can find me on those socials, all right? I've been doing a thing on Friday nights on Instagram that I'm calling Wine Friday. <laughs> and I've only done two of them, and I don't know if I'll do any more. Probably I will. And it's just a live stream thing, and it's kind of fun. But the action is on Instagram, okay? I find Instagram far less toxic and way less personal than the Facebook. Facebook's kind of all your friends, right? Or people you know, it's, it's kind of local in that way. Instagram, you're following just folks. Most of the people I follow on Instagram, I do not know. And they are celebrities and they are whatever. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a less personal thing. This kind of, kind of a distance. I don't know. It's a safer distance on Instagram. There's still jerks. Don't get me wrong. There's still conspiracies and there's still people yelling at each other if you drill into the comments. But for me, Instagram is just less toxic. Or at least it's easier to shield the toxicity on Instagram. So that's where I'm spending my time such as I'm spending any time on social media. I'm not getting paid by Instagram yet, but, you know, if you don't have an Instagram account and you want to follow what's going on, that's the place to do it, all right? I'm going to check out because I got things I got to take care of. I thank you for coming along with me this far. I thank you again for the feedback on the last episode. And drop me a line on this episode, man. I do want to know what you're listening to. I do want to know what you would like me to talk about. And check out the Samantha Fish, all right? Check out the Grinder Blues, all right? And I'm going to go now. I forgot to say last week the good things happen when you put yourself out there because I took away my outro. I pulled that as part of my streamlining progress uh, process, and nobody, not one of you, wrote to complain about that. So I guess that was a good move. But, uh, you know, good things do happen when you put yourself out there, kids, all right? Don't forget that. Don't let the darkness bring you down. There's a moment in the Grinder Blues song called Burn the Bridge. That was the first single they released. You can find the video on YouTube. And there's a moment where the music kind of drops out, gets very quiet, and Doug just starts doing the soul thing. <laughs> starts doing the soul thing like only Doug can do. And he's singing, I free myself to higher ground. 
I free myself to higher ground. And I recorded this. <laughs> you know, I am not an advocate of smartphones at shows, but I knew this was coming, man. So I recorded part of this at the show that I went to. And it's transcendent, man. And it's empowering. I free myself to higher ground. You got to free yourself, kids. Can't rely on anyone else to free you, man. And when you see all this toxicity, you got to use your own mind. You got to protect yourself. You got to free yourself to higher ground, all right? Don't get caught up in the crap, all right? Do your thing. Take a chance. Good things happen when you put yourself out there. And you know what? I'll check you later.